Acts chapter 9, please. For those of you visiting with us, we are trying to work through the book of Acts. Took a little bit of a break last week. And now we're back in Acts chapter 9. Looking forward to this text. And up to this point, we've seen some pretty interesting things. You know, um, we saw uh, the powerful and miraculous presentation of the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 2, fulfilling prophecy. And we saw thousands of people, Jews, come to faith. In Christ, we saw um, Ananias and Sapphira miraculously drop dead for their dishonesty by lying to God, the Holy Spirit. And we've seen Luke record for us through God, the Holy Spirit, in his writing, divinely, um, the preaching uh, to uh, an Ethiopian man who likely then took the gospel down to Africa. And uh, we've seen um, people, Samaritans, uh, receive the Holy Spirit through the laying on of the hands of um, John and Peter. And, you know, we've tried to note every time these things happen that Luke is telling us something. And, and you've heard us say, almost weekly, let's ask the question, why is God giving us this? Why is Luke telling us this? And, 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 and there's a reason for all of it. There, there's a purpose for it. So when we get here to Acts chapter 9, and we look at... Um, kind of an introduction or reintroduction to the what will become later on the Apostle Paul, we have to ask the same question. Why, why is this written? You know, we, did, we didn't see this kind of detail on a lot of other individuals in the past. Why, why Paul? Well, we'll try to answer that question. But let's go ahead and read our text, and then we'll dive into it. Acts chapter 9, verses 1 through 9, Luke writes, But Paul, or Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus, so that if he found any belonging to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Now, as he went on his way, he approached Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven shone around him. This is a miraculous thing. Another miraculous thing in a line of miraculous things. And falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul. Why are you persecuting me? Now, now try to think like you've never read this before. Try, try to imagine in your mind Paul walking down a dusty, dirty road and, and this light coming down on him as he sees the walls maybe of Damascus and, and then this voice from heaven coming down. Try to read it like you've never read it before. Okay? And he, Paul, said, Who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But rise and enter the city, and you will be told what to do. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless, hearing the voice, but seeing no one. Saul rose from the ground, and although his eyes were opened, he saw nothing. So they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And for three days... He was without sight and neither ate nor drank. You know, on the front end, this looks like not that big a deal. I mean, okay, we got the conversion of Saul, and probably 
you have a header in your Bible for this paragraph that says conversion of Saul or something like that. And it is. But again, Luke is giving us this for a reason. And we'll try to investigate that this morning. Father, we come before you in Jesus' name. We thank you for Saul's conversion to be what we call the great Apostle Paul. But Father, we also thank you for our conversion, that you have seen fit to redeem us, maybe not in the same way as you did Paul, but by the same means, and that is the blood and resurrection of your son, Jesus. And so, Father, we just thank you for that and ask that you will meet with us this morning as we look into your word, cause us to glean from it, cause our gleaning to be helpful to us and to be pleasing and glorifying to yourself. And Father, if there's anyone in here without Christ this morning, I ask you just to move in their life and draw them to yourself, please. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So in Acts chapter 9, verses 1 through 9, we have what I would entitle the transformation of a terrorist. I was reading um, a news report this week of um, the sentencing of a 13-year-old boy, and I can't remember where, maybe you read it. And apparently he had done, or maybe he was 14, and he had stabbed, I think, a 13-year-old girl 114 times. And at his sentencing hearing, um, his mother spoke. And, and, and the, the, the article said she begged the judge through sobs Wednesday to give the boy the maximum for killing her youngest child. And her quote was, Please do not for one second think that he could be rehabilitated at any point. He is beyond saving, she said. And when I read that phrase, he is beyond saving, I was just shocked. And I thought, is he? What he did was dastardly. I, I mean, there's, there's no doubt about that. And he should pay, you know, the highest price for it. But I, I'm just not prepared, and I don't know this kid, but I'm, I'm really reluctant to give up on anybody while they're still breathing. But, you know, sometimes we look at people and we think the same thing about them, don't we? Nah, that person will never get saved. God, not even God could save that one. Well, I would encourage you to have more hope than that. And I would also encourage you to not think so little of God as that. Because what we have here is God transforming a terrorist. And that's what Paul was. Just like we think of people over in the East today, and we've been embroiled in these wars for 20 plus years, and we have our thoughts about many of those people, and we think they could never be saved. They are, they are addicted to their faith. But isn't that why we pray for them? Isn't that why we're sending missionaries there? I mean, if you really think they're beyond Christ, don't read the pamphlet, don't give to the missions, don't do it. But, but we do. So we do. There was no doubt, and I think this is where we're getting to the point here with Paul or Saul. People who thought... Paul could never be saved. And actually, we see a couple hints of this. We'll see it in the next section. Ananias uh, is going to basically tell the Lord, hey, not Paul or not Saul. Uh, don't you know what he's doing? You know, uh, and don't we do that to God sometimes? Say, God, do you, you think you can really save this one? 
And then Barnabas is going to have to basically introduce Paul to the apostles later on because they don't want anything to do with Paul. So you can understand why they wouldn't want anything to do with Paul because he kills Christians. We see this in our text. Three points real quick. First of all, we see Paul's intent or Saul's intent. And that is to hinder the gospel. This is an unconverted man. He's very religious. And he wants to go to Damascus and arrest and imprison people who call on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now understand, you've got to separate the Paul you know from the rest of the New Testament into this guy. And he is breathing out threatenings. The idea is, you know, just breathing in and out ferociously like a big horse that's out of breath. You know, in and out, in and out. He's just after those guys. He's ferocious. And we know he's a killer because we saw that in Acts chapter uh, 8, verses 1 through 3. He just consented to a death. He gave the, go ahead, take Stephen out. Right? This guy can do it. And we know the Pharisees can do it because they did it before. They killed Jesus through Rome. But here's a question I have in this text right here, the first couple verses. So, so Paul goes to the high priest asking for papers to go to Damascus and uh, hail, you know, gather all these Christian people so he can arrest them. Now, understand, Damascus is about 150 miles away. Right? So he's going to arrest these people and then bring them 150 miles back to Jerusalem, likely. So he can incarcerate them. That's a, 150 miles is a long way even today, right, in your nice shoes, right? Much less back then, right? Why would the high priest want Paul to do that? There's a reason. And Luke doesn't tell us this, but we know. Because this is probably Caiaphas or Ananias who did what? They killed Jesus. Of course, these guys want Paul to go anywhere and cut off the head of the snake because they boogered it up by killing the Messiah. And you know what? They still haven't found a body. So if we can get Paul to go and stop this madness of followers of the way, that's going to really help us out. They want it to stop. Paul wants it to stop because the movement is continuing to grow. We've seen these people in Acts chapter 2, the 16 different languages being mentioned, and they're going out and they're sharing the gospel once they left. Many of these from the places of the dispersion, these Jewish people, maybe they're Greek-speaking people, back to their nations, and they're taking the gospel with them. They just got converted in Acts chapter 2. So Paul says, if I, let me see if I can get ahead of this thing. Cut the head off the snake and stop this whole progression of the gospel thing. The apostles are still preaching and the Jews haven't found a body. Imagine the problems that this must be causing for the religious leaders of the day. This is the problem. Not only was Paul ferocious, though, he was discriminant. Luke tells us that he was getting boys and girls, men and women. He was arresting everybody, taking everybody he can. Why was Paul so zealous? Well, he actually will tell us later on in the Word, Philippians chapter 3 and verse 6 says, As to zeal I was a persecutor of the church. So Paul's telling us right there how zealous he was. He also confesses his ignorance in 1 Timothy chapter 1. He says, Though formerly I was a blasphemer, persecutor, and insolent opponent, but I received mercy because I had acted ignorantly and in unbelief. So Paul tells us why he was doing what he was doing back then. And he was good at what he was doing. So Paul was very 
indiscriminate, very careful, very zealous. But he was also very tactful by going to Damascus. The faith had progressed. Remember when we were in Acts chapter 2 and we pointed out how that, you know, a lot of people think that in Acts chapter 2 when the church came together and, and, and they were meeting from house to house and, and they sold their goods, Acts chapter 5, and they were giving it out as, you know, people needed. And people try to take those texts and try to make out like the church is supposed to do that today. But we said, no, 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 understand those people came into Jerusalem. They were there for longer than they expected. Therefore, they needed people to kind of help them out. Well, this corroborates that position because we see that these people are indeed going back and the gospel is going back with them. And so Paul is trying to head it off. Paul is a zealous man for sure. And zeal, like fire, can be good or it can be very bad. Our first two introductions to Saul see a man zealous for God, but out of ignorance and out of faith. We can see the necessity for the reality that truth matters. Zeal's not enough. You got to be zealous about true things. We use this illustration all the time. People say practice makes perfect. Practice doesn't make perfect. Perfect practice makes perfect. Again, you, you can learn to hit a ball wrongly and be really good at it wrongly. But if you learn how to hit it correctly, you might actually hit the ball, right? So we can be zealous about things, but we need to be right in what we're zealous about. Amen? Amen. Truth matters. Your word is truth. And how much more ought we to be truthful? Like Paul, maybe we need to be corrected. So secondly, we note Jesus' interference. He cancels Paul's plans or Saul's plans by converting him. <laughs> he just miraculously shows up. And Jesus inquires to Saul. And he asks him a question. And it's a very interesting question. He says, why are you persecuting me? Now imagine if you were on that road, again, right? You're, you're walking down, you see this bright light, you apparently fall down, and this voice comes from heaven, and it says, why are you persecuting me? There's a lot of questions I would want to ask. Well, Paul asks one of the questions that are most obvious. Who are you? Who are you, Lord? Saul... And, and, and then, now this is where we're starting to get into the mentality of Paul, his thinking process. And this is going to matter, okay? It's going to matter throughout the rest of the message. Paul, or Saul, is hearing a voice from heaven, and it says something in the introduction. It says, Saul, Saul. You say, well, he's just trying to get his attention. No, to a Jewish person, this was what's called the heavenly echo. It's the daughter of the voice of God. Is how they, they put it in their day. So, this is important. When Saul heard Saul, Saul, from heaven, he recognized that, because Jews did this, as the voice of God. So Saul, as a Pharisee, has got to be thinking this is God talking to me, because only God talks from heaven. Now, think for a second here. This is transforming. All of a sudden, Paul's having a, 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 a climax collision in his, everything he believes. Because God is talking to him, saying that God is being persecuted by this man. Paul's got to be confused. Saul would have to have been confused because he thought he was serving God. But God's talking to him and saying, you're persecuting me. This is the conflict. And this got to be resolved. 
Because this voice would have identified Jesus as God. Think about that statement. I, I know you already know Jesus as God. But for Paul, this is the first time this revelation has come to him. So for him, thinking he's doing the will of God, to hear the heavenly echo ask him, he knows it's God, why he's persecuting him, why, why, is, why am I persecuting God? I'm not persecuting God. God just said you are. There's a conflict here. But because Jesus, and the reason why we, this is, one of the reasons why this is important is because Jesus points out the intimacy between him and his people in this text. Okay. So when, when Jesus says, um, you're persecuting me, who was, and I'll just ask you, who was, who was Saul persecuting? The church. Jesus just considered the church as himself. We already believe that, right? Baptized by one spirit into one body. That we know that we're the temple. We learned that from the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul is having a real conflict right here because this is the first time it's coming to him. This is new to him. How can this be? This would have caused Paul to see that Jesus was in the Christians and Saul was persecuting those people as well as God in heaven. Because the God of heaven, as we know, dwells in his people here on earth. And this is what Jesus taught in John chapter 17, verse 23. He said, I and them, and he's talking to the Father, I and them, and you and me, that they may be perfectly one so that the world may know that you have sent me and loved me even as you loved them. We take that for granted, but Paul can't do that here. So if Paul is persecuting Jesus when he persecutes the church, who is the church persecuting when we are not actively loving one another? When we're not actively loving one another, aren't we doing the same kind of thing the Apostle Paul did? Jesus' identification is given to us here. He says, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. I thought I was persecuting the church, and you're saying I'm persecuting you. They're one. Paul the apostle, as an apostle, as he stated. So Jesus then gives them some instruction. He says, rise, enter, and be instructed, basically. Get up, go into Damascus, and later on we'll learn that he's apparently said, you know, Ananias is going to come and deal with him. So in our first point, we note why some people would think that Paul was beyond converting because he was a ferocious, zealous, ignorant persecutor of God's people. But the second demonstrates to us that with Christ, and this is kind of one of my points, Nobody is beyond conversion. Please hear me. Please hear me. In Christ, nobody is beyond conversion. At this point, Paul's no doubt having a spiritual crisis. And thirdly, just some resulting issues for, the, for Saul. This meeting would no doubt have caused a flood of emotions, realizations, and questions for Saul. Think about some of the theological impacts that would have had on him. All of a sudden, he just found out Jesus is alive. He had just been hearing in Jerusalem that Jesus was crucified. And although they couldn't find a body, they had all kind of, you know, reasons for why they couldn't. His apostles stole him away, whatever. And now that unfound body is talking to him. That's got to be a, more than an epiphany for Paul. Whoa. He's got to have new insights on the Old Testament. So like we talked about last week, Isaiah chapter 53, the suffering servant, verses 6 and 7. 
no matter what Paul thought about it, all of a sudden he's no doubt, because Paul knew the Old Testament, all of a sudden Saul is realizing that that suffering servant in Isaiah was indeed the Messiah. That's a revelation for him. Because remember, he knew the Old Testament. You see it all throughout the rest of his writings in the New Testament, right? All of a sudden, he's starting to understand Isaiah chapter 7 and the virgin birth of Jesus Christ. The deity of Christ. All coming down. Thirdly, I would think that Paul is having some conviction because in Acts 8, verses 1 through 3, we saw that Paul consents to death. Now, Paul is being confronted as the person who okayed the death of an innocent man. Second degree murder, third degree murder, accomplice to murder, murderer. Now, remember, he's a legal guy. Murderers get stoned. That's what Paul believes. And he are one. He's been killing God's people. He's been hailing God's people. And he just realized he's a murderer. But apparently, because God's calling him now, here's another flood. Christ forgave him. All of a sudden, things like mercy and grace and salvation have new meanings. They're, they're not what he thought. They're far more than he ever thought. So what about some personal impacts? Godly repentance as a murderer. All the things that he has done to God's people. A, a, a realization that I can't walk the old past that I've walked before. My Pharisaic friends are, can't be my friends anymore. All these nice Pharisaical clothes I got to get rid of. Uh, all, the, all, all the power and authority I had as a religious leader is gone if I follow this way. Paul is going to be ostracized from everybody and everything that has made him who he is because he met Jesus. My dad's calling me. So I'm going to have to hang up on my dad. How's he going to live? Paul got his living as a Pharisee. Now he's just a dumb gospel preacher. <laughs> He, he's going to be persecuted. He'll tell us that later on. Uh, Jesus is going to tell Ananias, hey, look, go and tell this guy all the stuff that he's going to have to suffer for me. You're in trouble, bud. The high road's over. The gravy train is gone. You're scum of the earth now. Many questions about the law, I'm sure. Many, many, many other things had to be pondered by the Apostle Paul. And actually, you know, now, you know, looking at it from this perspective, as you look at some of the things Paul said in the New Testament, all of a sudden you see the contrast between what he used to believe and what he told us about in the, Old, in the New Testament, and you can see how he could write about those things with this fresh knowledge of Christ. He was an authority on the subject. Just as some supplemental thoughts, in Acts chapter 22 and chapter 26, Paul recounts this event and answers some of the following questions. Number one, did Saul evangelize his partners? Because yeah, I'm thinking, you know, if, if Saul went through all this, did he get to Damascus and say to his buddies, hey, let me tell you who I, I was actually talking to? I would think that he did, and Acts chapter 26 and verse 20 tells us that Paul declared first to those at Damascus, then in Jerusalem and throughout the region of Judea. So it could very well be that he did do that. Not explicitly, but probably implicitly. Secondly, and you don't see it here, 
but you see it in chapter 26. Jesus says, it is hard for you to kick against the pricks, the goads, okay? To, to, to make an, you know, a sharp object to, to, to move along an animal that wants to be stubborn. You, you, you hurt them to make them move forward. Giddy up. Listen, this is important. There are no atheists. You've heard me say that before. You know why I know there's no atheists? Because of this text in 2614. The Apostle Paul knew, like every unconverted person out there in the world, that there's something greater than him and whatever he worships if it's not Jesus Christ. He cannot fill that void because we are made in the image of God. Until God fills us through himself, the Holy Spirit, we will continue to be empty. So, so Ananias, or Jesus is going to say to Paul, it is hard for you to kick against the pricks. You're trying to deny that God's in the box, Romans 1, and, but you can't deny it. You know he's in there. You hear him moving around. They know. The world knows. That's why they're so mad at Jesus. Like I said before, they don't get mad when you say Jesus is Tony the Tiger. But if you say Jesus is God, they get upset. And thirdly, a caution. This is a personal caution to you. There, and I have seen it where in times past, people who are made aware of the gospel question whether they should give into it because their concern is, well, my spouse wasn't converted or my parents weren't converted. If, if, if I follow Christ then basically what I'm saying is my loved ones are not saved. They're in hell. That's a painful thing. You can't do any, listen, you can't do anything about them now. But it is a fool's errand to think that you can deny Christ in hopes of being with them in a devil's hell. All of a sudden, you made whoever that loved one is your God. And you decided you'd rather have hell with them than heaven with God. I know that's a hurtful thing, and I don't mean to be. But I would not be a good pastor or a good preacher if I didn't tell you that. Don't forsake the great God of heaven for anybody else. Don't. So let me give you three groups of conclusive observations. Number one, Paul's transformation. He went from being a proud terrorist to being led by the hand into Damascus. Like a schoolboy. He had his chest out. He was the man. And he was going to let these Christians have it. And he had the authority of the religious leaders to do it. Now he's blind and led by somebody else. Like a little boy. That's humiliating. He went from obtaining a writ to arrest to writing to those he would have arrested. So much of the New Testament is by this guy. He went from thinking he saw clearly to seeing clearly. He went from being having a religious commission to kill Christians to Christ's commission to bring life to the dead. He went from seeking to kill followers to being willing to die for them and the Christ. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? A lot of that applies to us, doesn't it? Because we're the same way. His Christ is our Christ. What we see in some today might be what God is doing in them for tomorrow. Listen. Let me help you advance um, in your um, discipleship. When you see the world, the way they dress, the way they talk, the things they do, um, don't discard them. Don't entertain them. And, and, and don't 
you know, kind of get in their face with any kind of self-righteousness. Because number one, it doesn't work. Okay, you're saying, you're going to go to hell. That doesn't work, okay? It feels good to you, but it does nothing for them. Secondly, quite honestly, that's what a lot of them want. Secondly, um, you don't know that they're not kicking against the pricks. God's moving in their heart, and the reason they're so animate is because they're kicking harder. And you kick harder and harder. You, you lash out more before you finally give in. Don't give up on those people. Don't be mean to them. Love them. Be Jesus to them. Be gracious to them. Just like Barnabas did with Paul later on in introducing him to them. Why did the Lord record this through Luke. And this is not a biographical treatment or a topical treatment of the Apostle Paul. But remember who the, the book was written to, Theopolis. Luke is writing to a guy we introduced to in the book of Luke, right? Probably supported him. And Luke is giving him all this historical information. Okay, so there's an there's a, there's a object to all this story, not just, you know, it is for us, but it was primarily for Theopolis. Secondly, to confirm the great apostles' ministry. Earlier I said, you know, why was Luke writing this? We don't get that, this kind of detail about everybody that ever got converted, but everybody's not Paul. Right? So, like, everybody didn't write as much of the New Testament as Paul did. Peter didn't, John didn't, whatever. They might have written some. But here we have a person who is going to be the greatest apostle that ever lived. And, and Luke sees fit, or God sees fit through Luke to give us a special commendation of this guy confirming that he is the one to do this. He is special. Or he's used specially, if I may put it that way. And to once again demonstrate the power of the gospel in converting people that seemed unconvertible. Ladies and gentlemen, don't ever give up on the lost people. Amen. Don't think that your kid is irredeemable. Pray more for them. Beg God, barter with God, do whatever you have to do. I, um, I have an unsaved kid, and I have seen some of these web pictures, the web telescope. And a couple of them, just in my praying, I, I kind of reminded God about <laughs> these pictures I've seen and how just vast and great these galaxies and whatever are so far away and they're so massive. And I tell God, God, you did that. It's nothing for you to save my son. That, that, it's not even comparable. The work's already done. God, please. Why wouldn't we do that for our kids and our loved ones? In Philippians 3, Paul said, verse 5 and 6, circumcised, he was circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, tribe of Benjamin, Hebrew of the Hebrews, as to the law of Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. But, verse 7, whatever gain I had, I counted as lost for the sake of Christ. When people meet Jesus Christ, everything else doesn't matter. It's dung. Trash. Then some personal applications. All salvation is miraculous. Paul's wasn't more miraculous than yours. It wasn't. Being raised from the dead is being raised from the dead. It might have been different. Jesus might have talked to him. Jesus might have shined a light on him, whatever. But his wasn't any more miraculous than yours. If you are raised from the dead spiritually, you're raised from the dead spiritually. It's that simple. Always expect 
God to do miraculously in bringing people to life. Secondly, anyone can be saved. And I put like in my outline like 13 exclamation points here. Anybody can be saved. As long as they're breathing and cognizant of what's going on. Think about C.S. Lewis who said he came to Christ kicking and screaming. The most reluctant, I'd say most reluctant of converts. But when God showed up, he's like, I can't, I can't deny my logic and not accepting Christ because it's so logical. Paul was a murderer, a zealous one. And it's Satan's lie to say that people are too bad. Maybe you're thinking you're too bad. You're not. You're here for a reason. You're not too bad. Don't think that highly of yourself because you're not that good to be that bad. You're not. It just proves God's grace and mercy are far greater than we can ever conceive. And then lastly, anybody can be used of God. You say, I can't be used of God. I'm too dirty. No, you're not. Take a $10 bill, throw it in the trash heap, get it as ugly as you want. You, you can still spend it, can't you? You might be wise to clean it off, but it's still 10 bucks. You are made in the image of God, and you're here for a reason. Paul was here for a reason. So are you. You can be used. Paul may not have been called with the other 12 or 13, but that was by God's design. God waited for this moment for Paul to do this thing in Paul. Paul worked hard at the ministry. 1 Corinthians 15, 2 Corinthians 11 and 12 tell us that he did so. He worked very, very hard at the ministry. That coupled with obviously God's grace. But the two are symbiotic. You know, you can't say, well, I want to be used of God and just sit in your chair. It's, it didn't work that way. I want to dig this hole and you stand on the, whoops, sorry, and you stand on the, the shovel. It's not going to dig. I mean, it's just, you know, that doesn't happen. Man, put that thing in your hand and start, sh you know. You can be used of God. Really, probably the question is, do I want to be used of God? Will you be used of God? And then sticking with Philippians 3, verses 7 through 10, Paul said, Whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as lost because of the suffering worth, uh, because of the passing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them but rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law but that which comes through faith in Christ the righteousness of God that depends on faith that I may know him and the power of of his resurrection. And this is why we oftentimes quote 2 Corinthians 5.21. For he, God, made him, Jesus, to be sin for us. Even though Jesus knew no sin. So that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Paul understood that. He cast off the law and accepted by grace through faith. And so we preach that same message today. Listen, if, if, if God can save a terrorist like Paul, he can save anybody. Amen. Amen. He is not limited. If he was limited, he would be much of a God, would he? No. Joel's going to come and lead us in a song, or Todd's going to come and lead us in a song. And then I'll come back and close us in prayer. Turn your hymn.